Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are well. Um, we're continuing our series in Mark today. Uh, today, we're loosely going to be in Mark 14. Uh, I am going to jump all over the place a bit and I'm going to reference things rather than necessarily read things, uh, but hopefully uh, it will be parts of the Bible that you're really familiar with. But I would encourage you, if you've got a Bible with you, open it up to Mark 14, uh, try and follow along and go, ah, John's here. Um, because, you know, it's good to have a Bible open, read along, make sure I'm just not making stuff up, because that would be silly. Um, so, yeah, uh, we're going to start briefly by looking at what Andrew Thomas brought last week. So I will very rarely do a recap on what's happened before, but actually for today's talk it's really useful. So the two main things that I want you to remember from last week is there was two things that Jesus said that were what you could call really spoilers. It was the fact that Jesus is going to die and that one of them who he knew to be Ju uh, Judas is going to be someone who betrays him and leads to that death. So you have the Last Supper, uh, they have a little sing song, which is nice, and then they head out on the road to the Mount of Olives. And en route, uh, Jesus says, you're all going to get really scared, you're all going to scatter, and you're all going to abandon me. And Peter pipes up saying, no, not me, Lord, uh, surely not. Um, I will never deny you. And Jesus says, yeah, even you, Peter, in fact, before the morning, you're going to have denied me three times. So with that one in addition, we now have three spoilers. So we have Judas, who's going to betray Jesus. We have Peter, who's going to deny Jesus. And we have Jesus, who's going to die. So those are the three spoilers that I want to look at today. So I guess you could call today's talk spoilers, as I've said that word enough times already to make that valid. Uh, but for each of these people, we're going to look at a few things. So I want to look at why does Jesus say it? Why does Jesus bother saying, Judas, you're going to betray me? Why does he bother saying, Peter, you're going to deny me? Why does he bother telling them that he's going to die? Why, why bother saying any of that? Uh, we're also going to look at what was their response to what Jesus said? What was their response to knowing their fate? What did they do? How did they respond to that? And then what followed, uh, what actually happened. And yeah, I think that should be, hopefully, it should be a interesting thing to look at. I hope you'll find it interesting anyway. I did, it was fun. Um, so I'm gonna pray before I start because I think that'd be a good idea. So Father, I just ask that as I look at this passage in Mark, as I look at the, the most amazing story ever, um, that you would just inspire me to bring what's on your heart for everyone who's watching to, to hear and that it would encourage and inspire people and do them good. Amen. So uh, the first person we're going to look at is Judas. So first off, it's probably worth looking at what Jesus says. So Jesus in Mark 14 verse 21 says, How terrible it will be for the one who betrays me. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Um, you know, which is pretty dramatic. Uh, so you're going to look at the first thing. Why does Jesus say this? So, you know, this is the last time that Jesus is going to be in the company of Judas. Uh, it's the last time he's going to see Judas before he dies. So it might, you might be tempted to think, well, you know, Jesus is angry with him. And he's using this last opportunity to go, you're going to wish you were never born. And I just don't think that's the case because that doesn't sound very Jesus to me. Um, and Jesus throughout the rest of this passage in Mark 14, you don't get the impression that Jesus is fuming. He's not turning over tables and he's not um, you know, ranting and raving. He, he sounds just really sad. So maybe it's that. Maybe Jesus is sad. Maybe he's actually not saying... You're not, you're going to wish you were never born. Maybe it's actually, you're going to wish you were never born. 
Um, you're going to be so consumed with regret and guilt that you're just going to be consumed by this stuff and you're going to be remembered through history as this bad guy. That's really going to suck. Um, and, you know, so Jesus is maybe just really sad about that and they're saying, like, you're going to wish you were never born and that's awful. Um, maybe Jesus is hoping for a different outcome. Maybe Jesus is hoping that Judas is not going to do it. Maybe he's hoping that by telling him that he knows that he's thinking of it, that maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he's hoping that God will use someone else to bring about uh, what needs to happen and not Judas, his friend. Uh, maybe, you know, Jesus maybe needed to die, but maybe not because of the acts of Judas. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, all of that's a bit sort of guesswork, really, if I'm honest. Um, but what was Judas's response? So it's interesting to note that John's Gospel actually says that at the end of the Last Supper, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus turns to Judas and says, uh, in effect, uh, do what you've got to do. Just make it quick. Make your choice. And Judas decides to betray Jesus. He absolutely does that which is really sad, and he does it for what is apparently four months wages, and it is the price that you have to pay if one of your servants is mauled to death by an ox. Just, you know, I don't know why that's helpful. <laughs> but apparently that is the, the cost. It, 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 if, if your servant gets mauled to death by an ox, that's how much Judas was paid uh, to you know, rat on Jesus, effectively. So... What was Judas's motivation? Why does he do this? What was he thinking? Um, and we know through passages in the Bible um, that Judas was a thief. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, he's a thief. He's a bad person. But I often find myself wondering, well, why was he a thief? Maybe there's more to this story. Um, if you think about people who steal things nowadays, they're usually stealing because um, they need to survive in some way or they're stealing because they've got some sort of habit that's really bad for them. So maybe like they're addicted to drugs and they're stealing to fund that. Or maybe they've got uh, like a gambling debt and need to get money quick. And I think maybe with Judas, the gambling thing may possibly be a, uh, uh, an interesting one to think about. Because it says, you know, he's, he's stolen money effectively from, from the pouch and... You know, he clearly has issues with money, so maybe he's got into gambling debt. Maybe uh, his friend, friends or family have been threatened, and this is the only way that Judas knows to to raise enough money to save his family. Who knows? Maybe, yeah, just to say that we see the action, but we don't see the motivation in this. Um, it does say in John that Satan entered him and before he does this, but... I, I don't know if it's just you know, John, the writer of John just was saying that it was the will of Satan that this should happen and I don't know how literally to take that. Um, but yeah, who knows? Anyway, so Judas's motivation is a bit unknown, but it's, it's not... There could be more to the story is what I'm really trying to say. So what followed Judas's decision to betray Jesus? Uh, what follows him going and saying, yep, I'm going to be your man, I'm going to have my money, and thank you very much. What, 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 what does he do? What happens? And like I say, we often paint Judas as this sort of like evil villain, but he doesn't take his money and ride off into the sunset going, -ha 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 -ha. Um, I will invest my money in genetics to create some evil flying monkeys. Yeah, he doesn't do that. He instantly, according to Matthew's gospel, feels full of regret. He really regrets what he's done. He feels terrible about it. He tries to give the money back. He feels so terrible, in fact, that he ends up actually taking his own life. And I just, I just think it's really sad. Um, and yeah, so Judas is told that effectively that he's going to be the villain of the story. And Judas really sadly accepts that. 
So Judas is told, this is how it's going to be, it's going to be rubbish, and Judas goes, okay, and just gets on with it. Um, like committing to like one of the worst acts in history, probably on par with, oh, thank you, Mr. Snake, for the fruit. So it's, it's just a bit mad. So that's Judas. Uh, next we have Peter. So what is said to Peter? Uh, so like I said, Jesus is uh, telling his disciples, you're all going to abandon me, you're all going to be a bit rubbish. And Peter says, oh no, not me. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, tonight, yes, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. And what is Peter's response to his fate? He says, no, I will never disown you. I'll die before that happens. So not realising the immense irony, Peter denies his denial, uh, which is just mad. But it shows sort of some of the character of Peter that almost denial is actually, for Peter, that's his go-to response. When something happens that he doesn't like, his instant response is denial. So that's interesting that in the bit where Jesus is saying this is going to happen, it picks up on a part of the character of Peter that is what happens later with it anyway. Anyway, it's very clever. So, what follows? So, Judas, um, you know, betrays Jesus. He turns up um, and it's really dark because it's night. So, the only way uh, the people who are coming to arrest him can tell who Jesus is, is for Judas to go and kiss him um, and say, sorry, probably like, I don't know, similar to when you kiss the ring of the king kind of thing to say this is the the top guy um and it's apparently also where the kiss of death that comes from apparently that is its origin is in judas uh, uh kissing jesus and revealing him to be jesus but anyway so that happens and peter uh takes out a sword and lops the guy's ear off um which is is mad at mad just uh peter is just such a such a bloke isn't he he's just uh, he's, the, yeah, just like fisherman guy with a sword. Hwa! Jesus heals that ear as well, just to say, you know. John's Gospel explains how Peter and one of the other disciples followed Jesus, basically. So they just towered along behind. Um, and this other disciple, who for some reason isn't named, uh, knows uh, the high priest who Jesus is taken to. So... He, when they get to the high priest's place, uh, the other disciple goes in and says, hey, I'm this guy, I'm cool. Uh, can my mate Peter come in? And then they say yes, and Peter gets brought in too. So Peter and this other disciple are in the courtyard and Jesus is in the actual house uh, talking with the high priest, getting accused and having not great time. So Peter's outside and he sat around a fire with a bunch of other people, um, but on the way into the courtyard, he's asked uh, by a servant girl, hey, aren't you one of Jesus's followers? And Peter says, no, for the first time. So it's denied Jesus once. Then a bunch of the people around the fire are like, hey, are you sure? You kind of look like one of Jesus's followers. Are you sure you're not one of them? She says, no, Peter says, no, definitely not me. So he doesn't, uh, denies Jesus twice. And then uh, the third accusation, uh, John's Gospel points out uh, quite comically that the accuser is a relative of Malchus. And Malchus is the guy who Peter chopped the ear off of. So this might be his cousin or something. And comes up to Peter and effectively goes, Hey, are you the guy that chopped my cousin's ear off? <laughs> uh, which, is, which is mad. Um, and... I'm, just like, I'm sure I saw you in the garden with Jesus. And Peter says for the third time, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know him. And at that point, the rooster crows for the second time. So Luke's Gospel's description of what happens when the rooster crows is sort of beautiful and yet painful to read. Uh, but it's, it's my favourite um telling of this part of the story. So I just want to read what it says. So it says, immediately while he was speaking, so immediately while Peter was saying for the third time, nope, don't know him, the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked 
at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. So although Jesus was inside, he, he was in the, the house of the, the high priest and Peter was in the courtyard, there must have been, I don't know, windows, I guess, you know, so they, they could still see each other, even though one was in the courtyard, one was in the inside. And I just have to wonder, what, what was that look? Uh, again, you could think he was angry, Jesus could be like, mm, yeah, you said no, but that doesn't sound quite right. It may have been a really sad look, just, you know, Jesus just sad at what's happening about Peter's denial. Uh, it might have been a sort of slightly disappointed parent look, you know, those looks you can get when uh, you've disappointed a parent and, and they give you a look that sort of, oh, you know, it's what's worse than when they shout is when they, they go silent and give you that look. Um, or it may have been a sort of, I know that you know that I know that you know that you did that kind of thing. Um, and just a sort of knowing sort of look, maybe with a bit of a sort of a nod. Uh, I don't know. But it's, it's just quite sad to read that, isn't it? That amongst all of that other stuff, and Jesus knows the exact moment to sort of take his focus off of the high priest and what's going on immediately around him and to look over to Peter to say, hey, this is the moment. So why does Jesus say it to Peter? Why does he do it? Um, so I think that if Jesus hadn't said, have said anything, Peter may have felt a bit bad about denying Jesus, but hey, who'd really know, right? You know, it's, he effectively would have potentially got away with it. He wouldn't have been known as Peter, the guy who denied Christ. He would have just, it would just been a, nothing really. But Jesus is, by telling Peter it is going to happen, made Peter realise that Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. Because Peter was thinking, I'll never deny you, I'll die first. I, I'm, oh, I'm Peter, I'm going to slice some ears off and scream murder and do some crazy stuff before I ever deny you, Jesus. And yet Jesus knows in this exact moment, Peter is going to be scared. Peter is going to be frightened and Jesus knows Peter even better than Peter knows himself. Uh, Peter was like this rough, tough rebel and Jesus was like, no, nope, you're going to be scared, mate. <laughs> all your bravado, all your talk, I know your heart and at this point in time, your heart is going to be scared. So when Jesus looks at Peter, Peter doesn't just meet eyes with his friend. He meets eyes with the person who he probably realises at that moment knows him the best in the universe. The person who knows him better than he knows himself. And yet the person who still chose to love him, still chose him as one of his followers, still chose him as his friend. And yet he knows everything about him not just his strengths, but all of his weaknesses too. And that's cool, isn't it? You know, Jesus can look at us with all our weaknesses, with all our failings, and actually still chooses us. So that you know, carries across today. And thirdly, uh, the last one I want to look at is Jesus. So Jesus has told his disciples a bunch of times, really, honestly, that he's, he's gonna die. Um, he does add in uh, when traveling, from the Last Supper to the Mount of Olives, that uh, once he's come back to life, you know, mentions that quite casually, uh, that they'll meet up in Galilee. So why does Jesus say it? Uh, why does Jesus tell them he is going to die? I kind of think it's a little bit like a heist movie. So if you think of something like Ocean's Eleven or similar, uh, maybe like Thomas Crown Affair, something like that, uh, Jesus is explaining the plan. He's explaining the plan that him and his father have come up with to save humanity. And part of that plan is for it to look like the plan has gone horribly wrong. The plan is for it to look like Satan's won, that Jesus has lost, that Jesus is getting going to get you know brutally tortured and then murdered. And that Jesus is actually like, right, this is the plan. This is it. This is all good. It's horrible. But it's all good. 
So he lets his disciples know that all this is going to happen and then says, after it's all happened, the rendezvous is Galilee. That's where we meet up once this is all blown over. And he would think that, uh, having been told that, the reason for Jesus doing that and saying that would be so the disciples don't freak out. But they absolutely 100% do totally freak out. So uh, why does Jesus say it? Uh, I, I guess they, it's just like the small, it's like a seed that he planted in the disciples. They didn't know once everything went crazy that it was all fine, but they knew a, sort of somewhere deep, deep down inside them that Jesus had said that it would be okay. So they had this almost like small hope that they were holding on to. Um, so the interesting th thing for me in this though is Jesus's response. Uh, to knowing that he's going to die. So Jesus was totally on board with the whole die to save humanity plan, but now he's at the point of no return. Sort of, you can feel almost like the weight of history on this moment. And now is the point of no return. And what does Jesus do? He goes to pray. And he goes to pray because his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So this is the moment for me where you see that Jesus is not just 100% God, but he's also 100% man. He's fully God, but fully man. And you know, God doesn't do mathematics, because I know that makes 200% and that's not a thing, but for God it's fine. Um, and he's about to face mocking and beating and death. And even more than that, he's about to face uh, the wrath of God being poured out on him. He's going to take the weight and responsibility for the entire sin of mankind on his shoulders. So Jesus goes to pray. Um, what does he pray? He prays, Abba Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Which is basically him saying, Dad, if there's any way that I can get out of this, can I go with that option, please? If there is no other way, fine, I'll absolutely go through with it, but I'd rather not if there's any other way. And then he finds Peter, James and John, who he brought with him, who'd left sort of just a little bit further away, who had fallen asleep on the job. Uh, he sort of wakes them up and then goes off to pray again. So what does he pray second time round? He says, Dad, if there's any way for me to not be the recipient of your wrath to get out of this whole thing, please can I have that option? But if there is no other way, I will absolutely do it. And he was so horrified by what was coming. It was so just, it was eating him up so much that he, apparently he was, uh, Luke's gospel descri describes him uh, sweating blood, which is pretty, pretty crazy that only happens when you're under absolute crazy pressure so why would jesus pray that god had a plan and jesus had been you know involved in the planning stages and god was going to go through with that no matter what right why would he bother even praying god if there's a way out of this can i have it why why would why would jesus say that why why would why 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 um so it's really confusing and complicated, but interesting. Uh, so basically, the Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, forever. That, and that means that his character will never change. God is always holy. He's always perfect. Uh, he is always full of justice, always full of mercy. He's always loving. Um, and nothing about that will ever change. But there are a bunch of times in the Old Testament where God seemingly changes his mind. So just to give you a few examples, uh, God is about to destroy Sodom and Abraham is not too happy about that and says, if I can find 50 good people, will you spare it? And God says, oh, fine. And then Abraham sort of works his way down, bargaining with God, eventually gets to God, if I can find 10 people who are good, will you, will you save it? And God says, fine. Um, when Moses 
comes back from the top of the mountain uh, to find a golden calf that people have started worshipping. God says basically, I'm done with these people. I'm just going to destroy them. They, this is ridiculous. I'm literally just over here and they've melted down some gold and started worshipping a, a cow. This is bonkers. I'm done with you. And Moses pleads with God and God says, okay, fine. Um, I won't destroy everyone. Um, so you know, Moses effectively uh, changes God's mind. Uh, God says he's going to destroy Nineveh and then the people of Nineveh repent. And so God doesn't. It says the Lord uh, relents and does not bring on the people the disaster he had threatened. So God said, I'm going to do this thing. They repented and then he said, okay, I won't. Uh, Isaiah tells uh, Hezekiah, God says, get your house in order. Your time is up, basically. Um, and Hezekiah prays and says, God, this really sucks. I don't want my time to be up. God hears that prayer and says, fine, you can live for another 15 years. So God's plans change or can change when we pray. At the very least, um, that's how it seems from our human point of view uh, with our limited understanding as human peoples. And I just think that is one of the reasons why prayer is so powerful, because prayer can cause God to intervene, can cause God to say, well, I was going to do this thing, but actually my, my people have prayed really hard about this thing and they really want this, so I'm going to give this to them. But in this case, uh, Jesus is praying and God says pretty clearly, no. <laughs> no, there is no other way. There is, there is no other plan. The Bible tells us that God the Father loves his son. During Jesus' baptism, the sky rips open and God goes, this is my son, I love him, he's the best. And if there was any other conceivable way that men, mankind could have been made right with God without Jesus dying in the cross, of course God would have done that plan. God would have totally taken the option of B, C or D, but there was only ever option A. There was only ever the cross. And that was the only way that we could be sorted and be put back into right standing with God. This is why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Because if there was any other way uh, to make people okay, God would have taken it. Uh, the world today will say that sort of all roads lead to God. And there's a story about uh, a blind uh, well, a bunch of blind people touching an elephant and one of the blind men is holding uh, the tail and says, oh, an elephant sort of wriggly and long. And another person is holding a tusk and says, well, no, elephants are sort of smooth and pointy. And another person is holding an ear and says, no, elephants are weird and flappy. And the, the, the moral of the story is that everyone has a piece of the picture and a little bit of understanding and you know, it's like that with religion, everyone's point of view is valid, but none of us have the complete picture. But that's not what Christianity says. Christianity says there is one way by which we can be saved, and that's Jesus. The other ways, and it's not a popular message, because it's not inclusive, um, but that's it. The other ways don't work, according to Christianity. It's like, uh, you know, we're currently in lockdown because of COVID. Uh, if someone in, or comes up with a, a vaccine for, for COVID, that's great. Um, and, you know, the, that person will tell everyone and everyone should know about this vaccine. But if I came up with a vaccine that doesn't work and tell people this is the vaccine that will save you and it doesn't, that's, that's not right, is it? You know, I can't go around going, well, if you eat five jelly babies and pat your head and rub your tummy, COVID won't affect you. You know, that's just not true. Um, so, you know, it's not inclusive to jelly babies, and jelly babies and patting your head and rubbing your tummy. But truth is truth. And, you know, that may upset some people. But ultimately, if you had the cure for something 
and you know that all the other things don't work, you're going to want people to know the true thing that does work, aren't you? So it's like that with Christianity. So we know that Jesus is the way and that there is no other way by which people can be saved. And that's why it's really important. Um, and that's why God the Father poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross because there was no other way. Uh, but Jesus ends his prayer by saying, not what I will, but what you will. Um, he says, I don't really want to go through this because this is going to be horrible. But if there is no other way, which there wasn't, I will do it. And Jesus, uh, when he goes to his disciples the final time, effectively says, get up. It's time. Let's do this. And he's up for going through with a plan. So Jesus knew that prayer can change everything, but he also had complete faith and trust in his father's decision with the answer to that prayer. And in this case, the answer was no. So what does this mean for us? You may be wondering, what has this got to do with the price of cheese? How is any of this relevant? Um, so the world today is full of bad news. <laughs> you will get told bad news everywhere. And you have, uh, just like these three people we've looked at, you have three different options as to how to deal with that bad news. So you could go with the Judas approach and just go, okay, that's happening, fine, I'll go with it. And just accept the bad news. You've got Peter's approach, which is, no, 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 no not listening, not listening, no, no, no. Um, which, you know, just denying that it's happening and living in some sort of bubble crazy land of nonsense, which doesn't help. Or you have option three, which is do what Jesus does and pray about it. Like Abraham did, like Hezekiah, like all the Moses, like the other people we looked at who got given bad news and went, no, that sucks. And pray to God about it. And... In a lot of those scenarios, God listened and said, okay, then I'm going to change this. So you know, even with uh, like COVID and stuff, we can look at that and, and have one of those three responses. We can sort of just go, well, this is the new normal now. It's fine. We can deny that it's, it's in existence. You know, you're just as a weird holiday at home. Or we can contend for it in prayer. We can pray about it and say, God, this is rubbish can you do something about this please but even among that saying god i would love for you to move and do this thing i would love for you to destroy covid i would love for you to heal everyone who's been affected by it instantly but if you don't i'm going to trust you on it and that is you know that's 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 a tough thing um to to say that and to to stand by that but that's the kind of people of prayer that we need to be saying i'm going to pray for this i'm going to pray for this hard i'm going to pray for this regularly because jesus didn't just pray once he went back and prayed a bunch of times uh you know god said no and jesus said okay then i'll deal with it i yeah i'm just going to pray if that's okay um i'm aware that this has gone on for slightly longer than i had intended uh, so apologies on that front but yeah, I just want to want to pray. Uh, so, Father, I just ask that you would help us to turn to you when things get tough. That we wouldn't accept stuff that's rubbish. That we wouldn't pretend that stuff that's rubbish doesn't exist or isn't happening. But actually, we would come to you with our problems. We would come to you with our hopes, you with our dreams, and say, please make these a reality. And give us the strength and the faith to trust in you that no matter what your response, we know that you can work together all things for the good of those who love you. So I pray, Father, just uh, encourage us. Uh, may, may we not just hear bad news. Uh, we say, you know, we spoke about in Mark a lot about how it's the good news gospel it's good news for everyone and I pray that in this time of bad news that good news will ring just as loudly that we would hear stories of good things and that you would encourage us with 
amazing works of kindness and awesomeness. Uh, so I pray you'd be with us as we continue to worship. Amen. <laughs>